to be here and have a chance on this Saturday afternoon to talk about the blue part of the planet. I sometimes am asked by kids, what can they do to make a difference about what's happening? A lot of reasons for being discouraged. The fish are disappearing. The lobsters, the clams, the oysters. We're on the red list, we humans, based on what we now know about what's happening to the planet. But I say, when you think about it, you could choose to be a time, to be, choose a time, to be born, to be here, on this blue speck of the universe. I think you'd have a hard time coming up with a better moment than right now, if you want to make a difference, if you want to live at a time when, as never before, we can see ourselves as we never could before. I mean, any little kid, like Jennifer, or like Martin, like David, or Tierney, like myself, like all of you, there's a kid in every one of us. We can hold the world in our hands, thanks to phenomena such as Google Earth, hold it around, connect the dots, see things that we couldn't see when I was a kid. And unless we act on the knowledge that we now have, imagine the opportunities that will slide by in our lifetime, or imagine the world that we can make a better place if we act on what we now know. I imagine the things that we now take for granted, including being able to see the world yet as a whole. I mean, as a child, I had a globe with big blobs of blue representing where the ocean is. But today, we know what Rachel Carson didn't know when she wrote The Sea Around Us, published in 1951. She didn't know that there were mountains down the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian Ocean. She didn't know that there's life in the deepest sea. No one had been to the deepest sea in 1950. Well, maybe they had been, but I mean round trip. It's, those are the only trips that really count. <laughs> and now, I mean, we're witnesses to history to imagine where we're going to go. If we are to succeed now that we're pushing seven billion people with an increase imminent on a planet that gets no larger, it's still the same size as it was when I was a child, or when my parents were kids, or on back through history. But our success has come at a real cost. And you've heard by my predecessors on this stage some of what that cost is all about. The loss of many of the big creatures in the sea. Ed Wilson, a Harvard biologist, has commented that on the land, it took us about 10,000 years, but we came close to eliminating the large, the slow, and barton, yes, the tasty. We had a habit of eating the creatures that surrounded us as hunter-gatherers, and we did a pretty good job of it. A lot of species were exterminated owing to our taste for wildlife. Even when I was a child, I had an uncle who was a market hunter, who took birds by the truckload, ducks and geese, from New Jersey marshes. They were marketed in the way that we now market fish. You commented, Martin, that we have gone through a history of being hunter-gatherers, but it, it's not over. We are still hunter-gatherers when it comes to the ocean. And one thing, that I hope we will learn is from what we've done on the land. The consuming wildlife has limits. We wouldn't have birds today at all if we still treated them as our predecessors did, just as something to eat. As good as California jays probably taste, as good as warblers are, 
You might know the, the nursery rhyme about four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. That's what we used to do. We used to eat songbirds. Well, now we eat their equivalent from the sea. Wild creatures, the eagles, the owls, the little furry things, and their equivalent are out there in the ocean. We've done such a good job that it's only taken us about 50 years to do the equivalent of what it has taken on the land several thousand years to accomplish because our technologies now make it possible to find, extract, market globally instead of just eating locally to market from one part of the planet and send it to the other side of the world. Never mind that it all tastes good. Barton, it does. A lot of things taste good that we choose not to eat. We have come to see other values for them. And I hope the time will come on our watch during this special time that we share that the attitude about what lives in the ocean that we now often think of primarily as something to eat, that we'll understand that the values are different, just as we've come to understand the value of wildlife on the land. That we protect birds, for the most part. We still have Kentucky Fried Birds. We still have Christmas turkeys. But we have largely given up eating wild birds. Not so the ocean. I was asked to appear on the Colbert Report a couple of years ago, and we got into this conversation about what we take from the sea to consume. And I said, you know, the Chilean sea bass that we call, um, well, it is called by another name, the Patagonian toothfish, but we're marketed as Patagonian toothfish. Probably not as many people would be attracted to dining upon it, but Chilean sea bass sounds pretty good. Or slime heads, orange roughy, it's a marketing job. And so Colbert said, so if we start calling earthworms Appalachian yard trout, <laughs> maybe people would go for that. We, how would we know? what Chilean sea bass tastes like, unless somebody extracted it from the southern hemisphere in deep water and brought it to our plates and then told us. At first, when it did come to a market, it was not considered to be a very desirable thing to eat. The same is true with bluefin tuna. Go back 50 years. It sold for pennies a pound because nobody thought that it was a cool thing to eat. Tuna was known as dog tuna. It, it really had no popularity in the market. Today, you probably know that bluefin tuna, if you get it with sushi or sashimi, or even if you get it as a tuna steak, it's pretty pricey. The highest price that was ever paid, as far as I know, for bluefin tuna, one fish, was three quarters of a million dollars in December of this year in the Tokyo fish market. It was kind of a special fish. It weighed about 600 pounds. I'm sure it made a lot of sushi, but even for three quarters of a million dollars, nobody knows how to make a bluefin tuna from scratch. It takes tuna to make tuna. As the chief scientist of NOAA back in the early 90s, that's the 1990s, not the 1890s, I had a little piece of paper come across my desk that said that 90% of the bluefins in the North Atlantic were gone. And that we had to set a quota to make sure that there would still be tunas in the future. And my reaction, since I didn't know what was happening with bluefin tuna at the time, was what are we trying to do? exterminate them? If so, we're doing a great job. We only have 10% left to go. Well, that was 1990. And it had only taken 20 years to get from where the tunas were to where they were in 1990, with a 90% drop. Well, the situation has not improved at all. In fact, it has 
probably gone the other way, not just for bluefin tuna, but for sharks, for swordfish, for marlin, for cod, even for small fish. We're so good at catching them. We're so good at marketing, at marketing them. And now there's seven billion of us who like to eat. Everybody likes to eat. The question is, what are we going to eat? And how are we going to feed ourselves? And I maintain that we have to look elsewhere for our calories. That taking wildlife from the sea is not a solution for feeding even a billion people, let alone seven billion or ten billion going forward. There are alternatives. A great reason for our success is likely to be because, among other things, first of all, we've got a brain. We can figure things out. But mostly, we, we're adaptable. We have a general appetite and a capacity to eat all sorts of things. So, here we are at this point in history with choices. If we get it right, perhaps we can by taking care of the ocean, restoring what we can, protecting the places that still remain in good shape, and hoorah for California for establishing a network of protected areas from one end of the state to the other out there in the ocean, mirroring the attitude about protecting the land with networks of state and national parks. The one thing that is of greatest concern, and you've heard it from the others here on the stage with me, is simply understanding the value of the ocean, the value of nature, as more than just a luxury. It's not an option. <laughs> we need to take care of the systems that take care of us. This is the first time in all of history that we've had enough knowledge and the ability to communicate what we know to be able to figure things out going forward. The reason that I think there is plenty of reason for hope is because we do have that capacity to understand and know. And this is, in all preceding history, the first time that we've been able to connect the dots and see the patterns and see things such as what's happening to the climate what's happening to the wildlife in the ocean and on the land, the diversity of life, the elements that keep us alive. Earlier this year, I had a chance to go halfway across the Pacific to a little island called Midway, well known for historic reasons, World War II, but known to others because it's a great nesting place for birds especially several species of albatross. I had a chance to meet one in particular, an albatross that is known to be 61 years old. Her name is Wisdom. She got banded sometime in the 1950s. So we know exactly when that data point began and since she was already nesting at that point. And it takes 10, 12, sometimes 15 years before albatrosses actually mature enough to begin to nest, extrapolating back the minimum age that she is of 61. I imagine what that bird has seen in her lifetime, what all of us have seen in ours, more change perhaps than during all preceding human history. But at the same time, we have learned what that albatross has not learned. We have seen and understand why the changes are taking place. Not just that albatross, but turtles that live to be as long as humans do, whales, there's some that live to be 200, orange roughy, some of those fish could live to be 200 years. They may know that the world has changed in their lifetime, but they don't know why. And even if they did, they wouldn't know what to do about it. The great news, the best news is we do know why the world has changed. We can look in the mirror and see what we have done to make the world a different place 
Sometimes a better place, but certainly different than it was 61 years ago. And the key is, armed with the knowledge of what we know, to imagine in the next half century where we're going to be and what we can do between now and then to ensure that there's a place for ourselves within these systems that keep us alive. Well, I think that anticipation is building for the next phase of this, this afternoon's program. And uh, I really look forward to seeing not just what you've heard here, looking at the, the scientific and the artistic aspects, but to see all of this come together in the performance that's going to happen very shortly. Journey, I'm going to hand this back to you.